Our goal in this lecture and the following one is to state and prove a functional central limit theorem. Donsker's theorem will tell us that a large class of stochastic processes, when appropriately rescaled, will converge to Brownian motion, which is the universal Gaussian structure in the category of stochastic processes. Let's start by recalling the basic central limit theorem. If xn is a sequence of independent identically distributed L2 random variables on some probability space that is standardized, that is centered with variance one for each term, then if we take the sum of those random variables up to level n and normalize by the square root of n, which is the standard deviation of that sum, then that renormalized sum converges weakly to a standard normal random variable. Now we can already think of this as a statement about convergence of a stochastic process in a sense, because the sequence Sn is a discrete time stochastic process. In particular, if we take those Xn random variables to be Rademachers, then this is exactly the simple random walk starting at zero. So this says that if we rescale this generalized random walk in the space variable by one over the square root of n, then the endpoint of the random walk converges to a Gaussian random variable. But we'd like a statement not about the endpoint, and we'd also like a statement not just about a discrete stochastic process. Can we make this into a continuous time stochastic process? The answer is yes. And here's the rough idea. We take, instead of Sn over root n, we take Snt over root n for a continuous time t. Now that doesn't really make sense because S of blah is only defined when blah is a non-negative integer. So as stated, this is only going to make sense when t is itself a non-negative integer, or at least a rational number, in which case this will make sense for some n's. But let's ignore that for one moment, and then note that we could write this, in as much as it makes sense, as snt over root nt, with an extra factor of root t out front. Now if t is a fixed positive time, then nt goes to infinity just as n does, and so the central limit theorem would tell us that this still converges to a standard normal. And if I take a standard normal and scale it by the square root of t, then that means we'll get convergence to a normal of variance t. And note that this is the distribution of Brownian motion at time t. So that suggests that we're on the right track. But first we need to figure out how to actually make sense of this. And here's how. Instead of taking s n t, we take s of the floor of n t, where the floor of a number a in the real line is the largest integer less than or equal to that number. Now this is always a non-negative integer for any non-negative integer n and non-negative time t. And so this is a stochastic process. It is a random variable for each non-negative time t. In fact, it's a sequence of stochastic processes. For each n, we get a new process, wn here. We can represent the paths of this process. It's just piecewise constant, of course, because the floor of a number a is constantly equal to some integer for a in the interval from that integer up to the next one. And so that means that if we try to plot the graph of a path of this stochastic process, we get the following. First, note that if I take t to be a sequence k over n, where n is fixed and k ranges through the non-negative integers, then this just is sk. And so on that scale, the scale 1 over n, we get these points, which are one representation of the values that sk is taking here. So here I had starting at 0, then x1 was 1, x2 was minus 1, x3 was 1, x4 was 1, x5 was minus 1, and so on. I'm also taking into account the space rescaling here, so this height is not 1, but 1 over root n, and this height is 2 over root n, and so forth. Now, what this 
is doing for us here, taking the floor, is making this piecewise constant as we go. So we are constantly equal to zero here, one of root n there, and so on. down the line. There is our stochastic process. We can see, of course, that it is not a continuous stochastic process, but it is a continuous time stochastic process. And this calculation we did here can now be made rigorous, and we see that as n goes to infinity, the distribution of this at time t converges to a normal of variance t weekly, which is the distribution of Brownian motion at time t. What we'll actually now show is that that convergence is not just at the endpoint. In fact, this process converges to Brownian motion in the sense of finite dimensional distributions. Remember, what that means is that if I take any vector, wn at t1, wn at t2, wn at tk, for any choice of times, t1 through tk, then that vector will converge weakly as n goes to infinity to the vector b at t1, b at t2, up to b at tk for a Brownian motion. Now to prove that, we're going to work with, instead of the Brownian motion and this process at those times, rather this process and the Brownian motion increments between those times, and then recover the finite dimensional distributions from there at the end. The reason is, of course, that Brownian motion is basically defined in terms of its increments, and as we'll see in a moment, this process also has easily described increments. So fix two times s and t with t bigger than s, and let's look at the increment, w n of t minus w n of s. By definition, that's just 1 over square root of n rescaling the difference between the sums at the floor of n t and the floor of n s. Let's write that out explicitly here to be clear. So that's the sum, k going from 1 up to the floor of n t of x k minus the sum k going from 1 up to the floor of ns of xk. But that's just a sum of some xk's. Which ones? Well, it's a sum over k less than or equal to the floor of nt and strictly larger than the floor of ns of xk. And let's note that the number of terms in this sum is precisely the floor of nt minus the floor of ns. And no matter what s and t are, if s is less than t, then that's going to tend to infinity as n goes to infinity. Therefore, by the central limit theorem, if I take that sum and scale it not by 1 over root n, but rather by 1 over the square root of this number, then that sum will converge weakly to a standard normal random variable. Let's denote that standardized sum as zn of s and t. And we'd like to compare zn to this increment of wn. Well, that's pretty easy. wn of t minus wn of s is 1 over square root of n times this sum instead of this constant here. So that just means that's equal to the square root of the floor of nt minus the floor of ns divided by the square root of n times zn of s and t. Now the floor of nt divided by n, well, the floor of nt is close to nt in some sense. In fact, it's nt minus some number, which I'll call double brackets nt, the fractional part of nt. And whatever that number is, it is in the unit interval. And so that means that this is equal to t minus something divided by n, where that something is bounded, and so that converges to t as n goes to infinity. From there, we see that this constant here just converges to t minus s as n goes to infinity. Well, now we can apply Slutsky's theorem. This random variable here, which isn't very random at all, converges to this, which means that it converges weakly to that, if you like. And therefore, by Slutsky's theorem, since this converges weakly to a standard normal, their product, which is this increment, 
converges weakly to this times a standard normal. But that times a standard normal is a normal of variance t minus s. So we get better than what we had on the last slide. Not only does Wn of t converge to a normal of variance t, but any increment converges to a normal whose variance is the length of the time interval of the increment. So that gives us weak convergence of individual increments, but we want to get weak convergence of joint increments. But that's going to follow just as well from independence, because from what we just developed, that increment from s sub to t of the process wn, well, that's a sum of terms xk over some k's here, where k is strictly bigger than the floor of ns. But that is therefore independent from all the earlier terms, x1, x2, up to x floor of ns. But the stochastic process wn is a renormalized sum of terms like that. And so therefore, this is also independent from the sigma field generated by the process itself up to time s. In other words, this process wn has independent increments, just like the Brownian motion. That coupled with the fact that the increments are distributed asymptotically, the same as the increments of Brownian motion is going to allow us to prove the result that we want at the level of increments. That is to say, we know that for any collection of times, and we're going to take them to be in increasing order. If you don't have them in increasing order, you can just permute them so that they are permuting the variables of all the functions involved and repermute them at the end. So it's always fine to just assume that those times are in increasing order. Then what we've just shown above is that these increments of the WN process are independent from each other. That is the increment from here up to here, then from here up to the next time, and so on down the line. And similarly, the increments for those times of the Brownian motion are independent. Now, what we also just showed is that those increments individually converge weakly to the Brownian increments. And so, by the last proposition that we proved in the previous lecture, and induction to go from independence of two to independence of many, we can therefore conclude that if you put those together to the vector of increments, that will converge weakly to the vector of increments of the limit, which is nearly what we wanted to show. We wanted to show convergence of the vector wn of t1, wn of t2, wn of tk to the vector b of t1, b of t2, b of tk. So how do we get rid of these differences? Well just one more application of the continuous mapping theorem. We can get from increments to the actual endpoints of the process just by adding. First note that t0 was taken to be 0, and wn and b of 0 are both 0. So we really just have wn of t1 and b of t1 sitting here. Now, if I add to wn of t1 the increment wn of t2 minus wn of t1, I get wn of t2. And then if I add to that the increment wn of t3 minus wn of t2, I get just the value wn of t3 that I wanted. Putting those together, if I use the function f at x1, x2, up to xk is x1, x1 plus x2, x1 plus x2 plus x3, all the way down to x1 plus x2 plus up to xk and I apply that function to this list of increments, what I get is just the endpoints, wn of t1, wn of t2, up to wn of tk. And similarly, if I apply that function to the increments of Brownian motion, I get b of t1, b of t2, b of tk. Now we proved that this vector of increments converges weakly to this vector of increments, and therefore, by the continuous mapping theorem, this continuous function of that vector converges to this continuous function of that vector, and so we finally conclude the weak convergence that we were after. And again, that assumed that the times were in increasing order, but you can always permute them at the beginning and the end, 
in order to complete this proof that this rescaled random walk process converges in finite dimensional distributions to the Brownian motion. Great. But what we'd really like is the stronger statement about convergence of the law of the stochastic process Wn to the law of Brownian motion. That is, we'd like to have full weak convergence of this sequence of stochastic processes to this stochastic process. What we've proved is this much weaker notion of convergence in finite dimensional distributions. So how do we upgrade from finite dimensional distribution convergence all the way to weak convergence? Well, we need tightness, right? That's what we showed in a previous lecture. Except there's a deeper problem first. These don't live in the same space. Brownian motion is a continuous path-valued stochastic process, and Wn is not continuous. So since their laws don't even live on the same probability space, it's impossible to even ask whether you get weak convergence. So before we can ask and answer that question positively, we first need to fix Wn and make it continuous. How do we do that? We'll explore that in the next lecture.